I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. A word about meditation. Um, there are many kinds of meditation and uh, a very common form is called various things. A, a common term for it is simply open awareness. Mindful presence, open awareness, that's it. Sustaining that open awareness is a deepening practice, but that's the essence of the practice. Wonderful meditation. Other meditations are about resting our mind on certain qualities so that increasingly we take their shape. Uh, they become increasingly absorbed in us. We become increasingly established in them. And uh, that's another kind of meditation. For myself, in many ways, the whole point of practice broadly and meditation specifically is about homecoming. Coming home to our underlying ground of being, our underlying true nature. So what is it like when we're really at home? What is our home base as beings, both biological beings and if you will, ultimately spiritual beings. What is our home base? I think the great teachers point out, and it's it's been my experience as well, that in that home base, there is an absence of pressure, contraction, craving, selfing starts falling away. And there's a presence of an underlying sense of awareness, peacefulness, equanimity, warm-heartedness, benevolence, caring, and a sense of feeling content, content in the present as it is, with perhaps an intuition that this opens out into something really vast, even timeless. Well, if that's our home base, uh, why not meditate on it. Why not come home in meditation? Not out of stressful striving or making it into a project, but listening to the call of the heart to come home, come home. So you can feel into your own true home. It's authentic. No one is telling you what it is. You're finding it for yourself. Maybe people like myself are offering some kind of pointing directions, if you will. But whatever your sense of home is, it's your own sense of home, and you can trust it. And so I particularly appreciate meditations in which we help ourselves rest. We rest the mind in what draws the heart, and we listen to the longings of our heart for our own true home. And then we rest there, and through the wonders of neuroplastic change, uh, those qualities that we're resting in become increasingly hardwired into our own nervous system as lasting changes of structure and function there. Uh, and more and more, uh, we're at home, at home, including in the wild and wacky challenges of the world, because more and more, we're finding that true home inside ourselves. And that blending of um, a calming with a heart open, not just calming indifference or calming detached, but calming, peacefulness, tranquilizing with heart opening. It's a beautiful blend. And in that blend can be a growing sense to be aware of, of feeling content in the present as it is. So that's... It's a meditation that I'm increasingly drawn to. Okay. So I want to I want to talk with you about something that has been definitely close to my own practice over the last year or so. And I think it's really relevant for the state of the world. 
And that's essentially um, how do we practice with sorrow? Sorrow about losses that just happen. People have commented in the chat about losses of friends, losses of companions, we might say pets, non-human animal friends, um, and also sorrow over mistakes we've made, things we regret, sources of remorse, turns we took that cannot be unturned, um, actions that have had consequences that cannot be repaired, uh, sorrows, sorrows. And um, sometimes the sorrow is very sharp. It's overwhelming. We can barely even think about it or be aware of it. We're just undone by it. Other times the sorrow has moved into kind of more of a dull ache or, a, or an ongoing reflection perhaps about an important relationship or an important life choice as you age. Whatever the source, there is sorrow. Uh, the, the first ennobling, ennobling truth um, pointed to by the Buddha was the truth of dukkha, the truth of there are un, unpleasant experiences like sorrow. There is sorrow. It's not the entirety of life. And with practice, we don't need to suffer our sorrows, but undoubtedly, there is sorrow, isn't there? So how do we bear it? How do we relate to it? Relate to it, not manipulatively, but respectfully, while being motivated to relieve suffering, including our own. So that's what I'd like to explore with you, practicing with sorrow. And in our American culture, in particular, um, there can be a real pushing away of grief, loss, the naming of loss. Um, and in, in particular, there can be kind of a, an embarrassment about it or a pushing away of the rawness of it, sometimes managed by moving from sorrow into anger or outrage, or a grievance, um, maybe even a cause. The, the grievance may have validity, the cause may have political import. And sometimes that can be a way to avoid um, just resting in the sorrow, <laughs> being real with it, with yourself, and real about it with other people. So it's important to be honest about our sorrows. Uh, you know, if we numb out or try to resist them or reject them, it's not very effective, is it? Uh, we're adding, you know, dukkha dukkha. We're adding sorrow to sorrow, uh, you know, suffering to what is already painful. Uh, doesn't really work. What works first is to feel it is to be real with it. Now to be able to feel the sorrow, we may need to build up other resources like being able to calm ourselves or not be entirely hijacked and swept away by our own mind. Certain kinds of sorrow uh, can have a traumatic weight to them that are served sometimes with professional help. Um, so, you know, be, be careful with the observation that an important aspect of healing and practicing with sorrow is to let yourself feel it, is to open to it. You know, I'm seeing people in the comments here um, about sorrow about the planet, you know, sorrow about others, uh, being staggered by the scale of preventable suffering in in our world, um, all kinds of sorrow, right? So the first is to let yourself be open to it. And it, it may be that there are certain kinds of sorrows that are especially difficult to open to because you had a role in them. And that's the kind of sorrow I especially want to focus on here. I'm, 
I'm not trying to ignore sorrow that is more about things that we don't have any influence over or it's they're not our fault in any way. Those are really, really important, certainly. Um, but I want to focus here on the complicated sorrows that involve our own actions in some ways, particularly often with other people. Decisions we made, even well-intended at the time, perhaps simply ignorant. We just didn't know things. And yet, oof, the consequences of all that, you know, are sorrowful, are, are sorrowful for us. So one of the things things that we can help ourselves with in terms of really feeling it is to name all the parts of the sorrow. You know, this part was my part in terms of my actions. This part is what I regret. And this part I have remorse for, maybe even shame, guilt. Different parts, naming them noting them, perhaps acknowledging them to others, being non-resistant to your own sorrows. So you might think here about something in particular that you just, you feel sad about when you think about it, or it's been an ongoing, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're still chewing on it. Like there was their part and then there was your part. And they had a part, let's say. They really had a part. And you're you're angry about their part, maybe. Or it was one of the reasons why you did what you did, understandably. And there were other people who had a part, too, okay? Um, it's really helpful to sort of disentangle all these elements. And over time, increasingly, you know, kind of stand naked in all that happened, undefended, undefended really present with it and feeling it. There's just no replacement for that. You know, letting the cold winds blow through you of all that happened, you know, and maybe you start crying. Maybe you just feel blown away by it, but there's something pure and you can know it that you're not resisting it any longer. You're, you've engaged a fearless and searching inventory in the phrase from Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, about it for yourself. Here. There's kind of relief. You're fully confessed. Can you be fully confessed to yourself? Maybe to some others, but fully confessed to yourself about all that happened, your part in it, and how you feel about it. That's really important. There's just no way around it. It's the hardest part, and I'm going to move on from that part, but it's a necessary part. And I have found for myself that um, we can be really taken aback uh, by what bubbles up, especially when we're ready to really face it uh, from our own history. But it's a really important thing to do. I think it's a really important piece of being able to go to our own graves in peace, you know, to just to know that, whew, I told the truth about all of it at least to myself. Then definitely a second aspect of practicing with this is making amends, making repairs as best we can. And sometimes that looks like finding a way to actually talk with the people involved. Sometimes it looks like um, making amends or doing reparative things or making contributions in other parts of your life. And know that you're making amends. Know that you are mending through making amends, amending that which is torn. Um, being of service, uh, looking at your life, even if there's been a mistake in it, um, and looking at your larger history of contribution, of what a good person you've been in so many ways. And most sincerely, how you are living your life each day in the light, walking the higher road. Not necessarily perfectly, not yet a saint, 
but still living in the light, walking a higher road, you know, doing the best you can and knowing you are, knowing you are really important. As important it is, it is to feel the sorrow fully. It is just as important to feel your own goodness, your own kindness, your own sincerity, your own practice. Feel it, right? That's really, really important, you know, right? And in situations, for example, as people are putting in the chat, like having lost parents recently, um, or others who are who are beloved and important, uh, what I notice about all that is that we can really let the waves pass through us without resisting them. While and it and, and it can really help sometimes to be aware of what is also true. You know, amidst the sorrow passing through us, so many other things are happening and arising that are good and beautiful, enjoyable, um, thankfulness inducing. So many other things are happening so that instead of being completely sucked into and bound to the sorrow, we can help ourselves to stay open and stay wide in our awareness. So we're, we're more like a large field through which that pain is passing. The grief, the mourning, this like the staggering loss of that other person, it's passing through, it's real, we're not resisting it, but it's passing through a large space of all those other things that are true. That really helps. And then third, along with really feeling it, and second, making amends or being aware of, of the goodness broadly the, through which pain is passing. Third, uh, boy, it's counterintuitive, especially for my kind of nature, but there's such a place for giving up. It seems like such a controversial thing to say, right? Give up. You can even try it on. Just, I give up. But there's something catalytic and powerful in just giving up. So what are we giving up to? We're, we're giving up that what happened did happen. I give up. <laughs> it will never not have happened. It did happen. I give up. Uh, there's also broadly, though, a giving up to all the many forces that were in the mix in whatever happened. You know, like I give up about all the different causes that led to my parents dying, maybe prematurely. Um, my wife's father died partly due to medical error and in a different set of conditions and probably a higher quality hospital, less rushing about, um, maybe with others who could have been with him to be more of an advocate for him before they just discharged him and sent him home prematurely. Um, you know, he would still, he would have definitely lived longer. Uh, we give up, give up to so many forces. It doesn't mean being complacent about them. It doesn't mean not telling the truth about them. Uh, it doesn't mean doing what we can, which kind of relates in part to the ways we can make amends or take constructive action that can, we can take refuge in, you know, to try to improve the systems like the healthcare systems or the ways people talk with each other um, to have a better result maybe next time or perhaps for other people. But still in the midst of it all, there's something really powerful about just giving up. 
and also giving up about who you are or have been. You know, the different currents, the different streams running through you that led you to act in those ways. I give up to being who I am. <laughs> What's that feel like? I give up to having a temper. You know, I give up to having been rushed. And I made a catastrophic mistake as a result. I give up about the tendencies in my mind that led me to do that. I give up about the way I was raised, that to which I reacted, which led then led to tendencies, which then led to that thing I did, right? Um, I'm speaking about myself here in somewhat abstract terms. Uh, you might have your own version. It's really powerful to kind of give up to all the causes and conditions in their complexity that have manifested as all that happened, including uh, all that has been manifesting through you. Try it. I give up. I give up. I give up. I give up about being someone who makes mistakes. I give up. <laughs> It's really interesting to find that place where really you let yourself give up while at the same time opening to and letting yourself be lived by um, powerful, beneficial, wise forces within you. It's a wonderful combination. I give up and I surrender to being lived by the best within me as it expresses itself in the world. Wow, that's a good place. Now in all this comes the fourth thing here, which you might have a sense of where I've been going, which is that as you probably experience, remarkably, <clears throat> when we open to sorrow, and we just kind of become undefended and transparent to it, blowing through us. When we do that, as the saying puts it, sorrow tenderizes the heart. There's a kind of heart opening that occurs, right? In the second and third, when you know that you've done what you can, you're living in the light, that itself is heart opening and it brings you into your heart. And also when you kind of give up, like <laughs> I give up, <laughs> that opens you too. Because you're like, I give up. Well, you're undefended. You're not, you're not making, you know, you're not pretending any longer. You just, I give up. Um, all of this can open the heart. And so increasingly, we we feel humbled by what we sorrow. We're humbled by the vast number of beings who have been wounded and have sorrow as well. We're, we're humbled by understanding our own role in the matter. Uh, we're, we're, we feel humbled, not ashamed, but more like humbled. We're, we're small. We're small in, in the vastness of the causes unfolding in this universe. We're humbled by the vastness of it all right, when we give up to it. And there comes a heart opening in the process. And helping yourself to open your heart and to rest in the heart and, you know, perhaps when you're dealing with other people that you've got issues with or, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing heart to yourself, you know, compassion to yourself uh, for how it all has landed on you for your own sorrow and regret and remorse, you can bring compassion to yourself, heart to yourself for that. And you can rest in the heart, including with people that, you know, you still have trouble with or who have trouble or who have trouble with you. Uh, it's a great refuge, right, to rest in the heart. And I invite you to kind of explore this territory of sorrow, 
humbled and heart opened. There's kind of a movement from the, the humbling of this that includes the giving up into a heart opening, right? You know? We sometimes don't feel we have a right to, you know, a heart opening. Um, you do. We all have the right at any time to opening the heart. And then in this movement, remarkably, we can find a gradual opening into an authentic happiness. Humbled, heart opened, and coming into happiness. It's an earned happiness, grounded in a willingness to really feel it, grounded in a knowing of our making amends, grounded in a fundamental kind of surrender. Um, <laughs> bare and open in reality, right? Grounded in that, there can come an authentic happiness, knowing you've done what you can, you've rested in the heart, it's okay. You're allowed to be happy. And related to this, there can be a very important step in which we give ourselves permission to turn a corner. We're not resisting anything, we're not suppressing anything, but we're letting ourselves know, ah, I have felt this enough. I've scoured my soul, I've looked deeply, I've made amends, I've let it, I've let the feelings flow, I've cried those, shed, I've shed those tears. Um, you know, I'm gonna allow myself to gradually disengage. I'm gonna allow myself not to be preoccupied so much anymore. I'm letting it go, turning a corner, I'm letting myself turn that corner and um, I'm allowing myself to be happy. It could be a bittersweet happiness. Often, it, it, there's a mingling in it, you know, of, of sorrow and love and an allowing of well-being to come again. But it's really important to allow that well-being to come again and to allow yourself to rest in it, both out of kindness for yourself and, and out of a realization that as, as you rest there yourself, you're, you're more helpful and effective for others. So I, I, hope, um, I hope you could find your own place in this kind of path I've been walking with you experientially, these different steps along the path. And um, just to kind of summarize again, and then I'll take a look more and what's come in the chat and respond to things there, and perhaps even talk with one or two of you, um, um, just back and forth live. Um, there's this progression where there is sorrow, when there is. There is that which we're sad about. Um, it's important to really be honest about it and to, to allow it, to make room for it, to recognize and accept and investigate it. Um, it's important to do what we can about it, if it's appropriate at all. Sometimes there's nothing to do. We're just dealing with our grief over the passing of our parents, let's say. Um, sometimes there is something to do, particularly if our sorrow is related to some of our own mistakes. So we make amends, we do what we can. And then in all that, we try to have wisdom and perspective, including the wisdom of just giving up giving up to the way it is, giving up to who we are, giving up to all the forces moving through us. And then in that is a, is a humbling. In the giving up is a humbling. Not shame, but a humbling. And in that humbling can be found a heart opening. Heart opening. And in the heart opening can be found a happiness. So I invite you. 
into this uh, this organic kind of natural unfolding uh, so that you can increasingly rest in a, in a genuine happiness that is grounded and rooted in your own practice. So let me take a peek now at some many, many, many beautiful comments, many, lots of wisdom flowing in here. Really good. Um, let's see here if, um, so Melina asks at five minutes past the hour, how to know when is the right time to give up? What if I'm not doing enough? Great question. Um, we actually usually do know, you know, and um, I think it's always the right time to give up. And it's always the right time to keep practicing, the two together. So um, giving up might be meant in a very concrete sense, like just realizing that, you know, there's no more cheese down that tunnel. You're never going to get blood from that stone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I find for myself that uh, usually when you, let's say, or I go to like a big picture view and just kind of look closely and we ask ourselves, are there stones unturned? Are there still things to do? Is there a deeper level to engage here, to try to deal with things here? Or when you really look at it all, you may really see that the causes and conditions are not fertile. They're not auspicious. Uh, you're not going to be able to grow roses in that parking lot, for example, or corn in the Sahara Desert, etc. And you just know, and you just know. And there can be a kind of disenchantment that occurs um, where, in effect, you're surrendering to the way it is. That's what I really mean by giving up. I'm talking about releasing resistance to the, to the truth of it all and giving up to the way it is, including that sense of just like giving up to all the forces, the, the reality of all the forces moving through you. There's something really weirdly relieving and releasing in that giving up. Okay, so questions? Comments, particular tough situations. I'm seeing people talking about calming. Great. Yeah, so at two minutes past the hour, Ruby asks, um, can you speak to the loss of a, of a breakup? Krista, talks about it as well. Uh, both parties were still in love, but also both have their own trauma to work through on their own. So the union must come to an end. Um, what strikes me about that, first of all, is the insight and clarity of, of the people here. And that's, I think, really, 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 um, you know, relevant here. I think second, it's to appreciate that we can still be rested in the heart and rested in love while also recognizing the practical reality of something that you know it's not working or we're not yet a, we're not you know or the costs are greater than the benefits or we're not really ready for this yet and that's okay and i think also in that it's really useful to watch these little voices in the mind I've talked about sort of the inner ad agency, you know, and more primitive parts of the brain that are just kind of whispering to us unrealistically about, you know, what we ought to want. And the truth is that they're, they're, they're trying to, they're tricking us. You know, they're trying to talk us into doing something that's not really grounded on wisdom. And um, I find that it's really helpful, like I've said, to just kind of go to this big picture perspective in which you can really see, ah, that's just not realistic. It's just not realistic. It's really helpful to make yourself, just imagine the bird's eye view or you're sitting on the mountaintop, right? And you're looking out over the, the dusty plains, you know, the valley below. You're seeing everything from that big picture perspective. What do you see? What's the truth that you see? Occasionally, though, 
and I don't know if this is the truth in your situation, occasionally in relationships, you realize that you've gotten caught up in a side issue of some kind uh, or preoccupied with something. And when you really step back, and even sometimes when you just kind of give up about, yep, that's going to be an ongoing thing in this relationship, I give up. When you look closely, though, you realize, wow, you and that other person have something really special. And um, the clock is ticking in this life. Each day is passing. You know, How likely is it, really, that you're going to find that? Um, with another person. So I hopefully I'm not causing trouble here, but you know sometimes I think what happens for people is they realize that uh, you know they can find a way to just really rest in their love for each other and not you know struggle so much with the forms of their relationship or details of scheduling or you know how people maintain being roommates, things like that. And sometimes people have to actually, by the way, disentangle their their involvement with each other in various forms, like in a business or actually living together. But when they disentangle those those points of contention, those intersections where there's friction, suddenly they're great. They're great. Their relationship doesn't, you know, doesn't have the kind of classic form that they sleep in the same bed um, every night. Um, but on the other hand, wow. There's room now to have that relationship, and they, you know, they don't need to let go of it. I don't know what to, you know, is. I don't know the specifics here, uh, but I will just offer that kind of in a general sense. Okay, sorrow, letting go. Um, let's see. Great comments. Great comments. Um, wonderful comments. I appreciate it. Uh, some sorrows feel crushing. Fran writes that, 14 past the hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, what do we do, though? What do we do then? I mean, can we give up about feeling crushed and being crushed? Can we let ourselves feel that? You know? Um, is it appropriate to just touch it briefly and then disengage because it's too much? There's, there's that too, you know. Um, I think in the rhythm of sorrow, um, there are times and moments when we're just absolutely swallowed up by it. And the best we can do is just keep breathing. Put one foot in front of the other, drink a little water, get through the day, get through the event. You know, and that's all we can do. But that extreme, overwhelming, shattering kind of grief um, doesn't, it's not permanent. It's not permanent, you know. Um, if it becomes really permanent, then that's honestly a clinical issue after a while to really kind of look at what's involved with that. And that's, that's a complicated topic. But in most cases, there is the sorrow and, you know, there is the sorrow and uh, the work of the day. There is the sorrow and uh, other relationships. There is a sorrow and the ongoingness of your living. And since you are living, how do you want to live? And. You know, uh, there is the sorrow and there is insight into its nature as an experience inherently as made of parts that are connected and changing and thus empty of absolute essence, right? Um, I think, too, there's a little bit of a perspective here in life. I think some people can err, as I have erred, on swerving too much away from the sorrow, other people, they can just be too swallowed up by it. And it's important for them to remind themselves that there's sorrow and. What is the and? 
What are the many ands alongside that sorrow? That's really important. One thing to say, of course, is that part of the and is the sense of common humanity, you know? Um, in the sorrow and there's a sense of fellowship with others who've also had losses, who's all, who have also made mistakes, who have also really screwed up about one thing or that. Um, that's also there with the sorrow, right? Okay. Great. Okay. So I see great comments, really good comments coming in. I can see um, Linda Ling Lee. So I'm going to ask you to unmute and then we'll finish with you tonight. So great. Ling Lee. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me this time. And uh, I um, really resonate um, with the giving up piece. And I wonder if I can have a minute and be share my experience. Please. Yeah. Um, and also I want to get through sharing, maybe I can hear some insight from you. Well, this is a cause that I've been waging the war for maybe the past 20 years mm. in my own family. I was trying to change something. Yeah. And then recently, I just got to, to the point that it was there was so much resistance, so much work, and yeah. it started to hurting my my own health. And um, I'm realizing that I have nothing left to give mm. uh, to change because it's really taking my life out of me. And that was a moment that. I literally felt like I'm on my knee, I'm, I'm giving up. Yeah. I can no longer fight this. And uh, it was completely not my choice. Right. The, the giving up part. Uh, but once it landed on me, like I felt that sense that was just so much cause and force in play. And I'm not like, I'm not um, equal to it. Right. So what are and, you getting at? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm following yeah. you, but I'm wondering what your question is or what you're getting at. Yeah. There's something like, one thing I'm getting at is that giving up process, sometimes it's not voluntary, at least for me. Sure. And then in that process, like when it was forced upon me by this, yeah. just I realized how powerful the force is. Yeah. It kind of also opened me to, to what is there. Like, right. I'm not trying to change it. Yeah, that, exactly. So I hear you as sharing a very deep experience you've had where all you could do was surrender. And I want to kind of, complicated very slightly, partly related to some comments that have come in the chat. To be really clear, first of all, sometimes we're not ready to give up. We're not. It's just not true for us. And in a funny way, we can then give up about the fact that we're not ready to give up. You know, I give up that to, to being stubborn, determined, and absolutely, you know, not going to stop going after that result, let's say, okay? I give up. <laughs> That's how I am. So in a, it, it's interesting to explore giving up about not giving up. I just want to say that part, okay? And then the other thing I want to say is that I'm not, um, I th in, in terms of my account of sorrow, I think there are sorrows that are so intense and certainly these may be well be sorrows I have not experienced myself. There are sorrows that are so intense that the nat there is a natural uh, um, inability or incapacity to just open to them because they're too intense. They're overwhelming. I get that. I really do get that. And I'm not trying to be prescriptive and say, oh, you should fully feel them if you're, you know. If it's too intense, like the loss of a life partner, it's just so overwhelming. 
Um, that's before, that's happening before the processes and stages that I'm talking about. Um, and I'm not trying to force a kind of practice on people for whom it's just, it's not available, it's not right. Right, that, that's a really important point. Okay, so as we finish here, coming back to you, Linda. Oh, I'm gonna un ask you to unmute again, okay? So getting that you've shared experiences you've had where you just had to surrender, and in the surrender, in the giving up, you really were pulled into something very deep for you, right? That's what I'm hearing so far. Finishing here, is there more you wanted to say about that? Um, I think one thing I'm learning is um, the solo, like yeah. the, the initial solo, yeah. like that is what I don't want to fear, feel. Very good. Oh, okay. You but once I'm able, feel. it's like when you talk about in the initial, like allow us to feel the solo, that solo initially I cannot bear to feel it. But when I'm giving up, I know that I have to face it. That mm. was also really a surrounding moment and knowing that yeah. this is a grief of life and I have to face it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I think that's actually a beautiful place to end here. Uh, and if I could, again, I would just really like to underline, like with any of these talks or any teachings from anybody, their offerings to see and find what is relevant for you, what is relevant for you in all this, at your place with, with what you're dealing with at this time, right? Um, and, <clears throat> you know, in all this and kind of implicit in what I've been talking about, uh, which goes back to the meditation we did about coming home, it's the sense that um, our natural state is healthy. Uh, that in in our opening, we can in effect fall back into who we are and who we are will catch us. It takes repetition often, you know, initially a little bit of a falling back and then a little more of a falling back and then sometimes a full falling back. And then sometimes we can't help it. We're just pulled back. But eventually we find that there's a natural healthiness in us a natural wisdom, a natural kindness, a natural lovingness that uh, is our refuge, right? And we can trust it. I think that's implicit in what I've been talking about with you tonight and also what other people have been sharing. 